Okay, Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Thursday night step, uh, type of one, if you can hear me in room. Okay. I posted the link in the room and at Matsari.com. So um, it's we're on Psalm 64, part two, and it's titled Being Rich Towards God. And uh, we'll be looking at the Midrash Tehillim, the rabbinic commentary portion of the scripture. Or just a rabbinic commentary. <laughs> Okay, so um, before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together and study your word. Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts tonight. I ask, Lord, that you would help us to apply these truths to our lives for your glory. We give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, I posted a link in the room, and we're down on page. Let me scroll down here. A second. Uh, wow, we're down on page 12. Okay. So, um, Midrash Tehillim on Psalm 64 had only one part, and so I had to make it stretch. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, anyway, I'm just I'm just kidding. But um, I like to get five pages, you know. So, but uh, anyway, you know, doing an in-depth study, I like to have, you know, five pages. Or ten. I mean, sorry, ten. But anyway, so on page 12, uh, I outlined the midrash, the, and there was only one uh, midrash this, in this uh, part on Psalm 64. And I outlined the midrash in a typical form. Okay, so in Midrash to Tehillim 64, part 1. It opens with the Debor Hamat heel, the opening phrase, and it says, <clears throat> For the leader, a psalm of David, Hear my voice, O God. In my prayer, preserve my life from fear of the enemy. And the rabbis are looking at Psalm 64, verses 1 through 2. And the rabbis open looking at David calling out to the Lord to hear his prayer and to preserve his life. In the homiletic introduction to the Midrash, it states that these words are to be read in light of what Scripture says elsewhere. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And they look at Amos chapter 3, verse 7 as a proof text. And the rabbis say that the Lord will surely do nothing Okay, in the homiletic introduction. So why do they say that God will do nothing? What do you think about that? <clears throat> Could this be related to the question of why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? And the consequences that fall upon uh, our choices in life. The Torah tells us that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, that God created man in his image, and in the image of God he created him. So how are we to understand what it means to be created in God's image? Man is finite and corporal, so how are we created in God's image? In the image of God that is, that is described in the scriptures may be dealing with the non-physical part of us, the spirit and the soul. An example of this may be related to our desire for morality and meaning in life. Our desire to make a difference may be derived from the soul which is made in the image of God. Ellie says in a room that one way that we're made after his image is by our creativity, and that's that's true. Because we have that capability of creating things, you know, making up something new, inventing, you know. And by the image, this image of God, that we are given the ability to make independent choices. And just like Ellie was saying that for creativity. And such as that of uh, moral character. In addition, the one thing that sets us apart from the rest of creation is our ability to create new things and to improve our living conditions. And the choice, the, the concept of choice, is most important important here because it is our ability to choose that makes life meaningful for each of us. An example is found in a difference in being programmed. The difference between being programmed for love versus having the choice to love. And the difference between these types of love is what makes love significant. And similarly, if I didn't have the choice to do ma'asim tovim, to do good works, 
but was programmed to do good, then there's nothing meaningful about doing good. And um, Ketura says that creativity extends the ability to put scriptures together. Yeah, yeah, and find connections. Yeah, that's that's good. Yeah, and when uh, we talk about this being created in the image of God and having creativity and the ability to choose and have choices, being able to choose to do good then brings with it a lot of meaning. And uh, whereas, you know, choosing to do evil also brings with it a lot of meaning. And we know that throughout the scriptures that, um, you know, there's there's a lot of, uh, you know, connection there with regard to what we choose in, in our lives and, you know, from the physical to the spiritual, you know, etc. Now, if I had the ability to do both good and evil, then the concept of good becomes significant. And the message here goes deeper because our choices have consequences. For example, if every time I got in trouble, my dad come to bail me out, that's not real choice. Choice brings with it consequences. And throughout history, from a national perspective down to the individual uh, consequences, um, or to the, it, from the national perspective down to the individual, consequences follow from our choices. And then, for example, in Parashat Devarim, the people fear, their fear leads them to a failure to trust in God. And as a result, they rebel against God's plan for them to enter into the promised land, to the land that God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Lord then brought Israel out of slavery or the Lord had brought Israel out of slavery in Egypt, even giving them his Torah at Mount Horeb at Sinai. And he brought the people swiftly to the borders of the Promised Land, according to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 19 to 20. And Moshe then announces it's time to enter the land, but the people are fearful of the Amorites who occupy the, bo the borders. Their choice to fear the Amorites rather than God and their lack of trust in the Lord led to their spending an additional 40 years in the wilderness and then dying in the wilderness. And that's exactly what the Torah says the reason was for their spending the next 40 years. And so could our own fear and lack of trusting in the Lord lead to the Lord doing nothing? You know, I thought that when we think about the Lord, the rabbis questioning, or actually their statement on the Lord doing nothing, I uh, might be a result of our lack in, of the fear of the Lord and our trusting in Him. Um, anyone have any comments on that? Let's see. Okay, so the image of God means that God created beings who have the ability to make decisions, and those decisions will create consequences which make us co-partners with the Lord in the direction and the development of the world. Now, based on these things, at least this understanding, we have our answer to why bad things happen to good people. When bad things happen, there are many possibilities as to why it is happening. A few questions come to mind regarding that question, and on page 13, I have a little outline of these questions. One is, and this is why bad things happen, is this, then the questions we would ask ourselves, uh, if we're going through a challenging time in life or, or whatnot, is this a challenge in life that was given to me so I could become an example to inspire others? Number two, is this to get me to fix a wrong that I have done? Number three, is this due to historical or national consequences that are affecting me as an individual? Number four, is what's happening to me now the result of a choice that I have made in the past? And number five, am I on my own because I have distanced myself from the Lord through sin? And I think that each one of these questions are all valid today for each one of us. Um, Katura says that I have a friend who said it's easier to pray for other people, but when it comes to me, it's like, well, whatever you want, okay. Yeah. Okay, and then um, these, these are very important questions we have uh, outlined here in the, in the study. And this question of why bad things happen may be the reason why the rabbis open with the comment based on David's crying out to the Lord to hear his prayer and to preserve his life from his enemies. The rabbis quote from Amos chapter 3 verse 7. 
And so Amos chapter 3, verse 6 through 8, it says the following. It says that if a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people trum tremble? If a calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? Surely the Lord God has done nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? Let's see. Katura uh, has another question that she says that number six, you know, in, according to this, I have questions one, two, three, four, and five. Her number six is are we going through a difficulty that elicits a response from another person so that we can learn something about them, understanding about how another person thinks? That's a good one. Yeah, I think that's a good one too. So the scriptures say that the Lord reveals to his prophets the reasons trouble come. And the Midrash continues by drawing a parallel between David and Daniel, saying that the Lord made known, made known to David what he would do to Daniel. And so on, part, on page 14, I quote from the Midrash, and it says, Rabbi Tahalafia, Tahalafia, huh, it's a strange name, maintained, the Holy One, blessed be he, made known to David that would be done, what would be done to Daniel. Indeed, had the heathen any power at all to do anything to the Holy One, blessed be he, they would have done it. In this, the sons of Korah implied when they said, They have cast fire into your sanctuary. That is, had the heathen been able to ascend so as to break into the heavens, they would have broken in. For the words, But now they break down in carved work thereof with axes and hammers mean that since the heathen are unable to break into heaven, they broke down the sanctuary on earth. In the words, the kings of the earth stand up, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, you know, Psalm chapter 2, verse 2, mean that because the heathen could not prevail against God in heaven, they took counsel against Daniel. As I said, all the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps took counsel together that the king should establish a statute and make a strong interdict that whosoever will ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days save of you, O king, he will be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the interdict and sign the writing. That was from Daniel chapter 6, verses 8 through 9. Uh, Ellie says that I used to have a sign on my fridge years ago that said, and it was a quote, and I forget the author, that said, in effect, there are things God will do if we pray that he might not do if we, do, if we don't pray. Yeah, that's true. I think that's true, too. Okay, so in the, in the Midrash, the rabbis are drawing a parallel between David and Daniel, or maybe not so much a parallel, but uh, they're saying that the Lord revealed to David what he was going to do to Daniel. And so the concept here is that if the heathen, the ungodly, or the, uh, the unrighteous, or the wicked, have the power to do anything to the Lord God in heaven, they would have done it. That if they could have broken into heaven, they would have done so. But since they did not have the ability to do these things to the Lord God in heaven, they would do these things to God's servants. And this may be the reason why the rabbis say God reveals or makes known to David what happened to Daniel. This statement in the Midrash alludes to the rabbinic thought that David was also a prophet. And the comparison here is regarding the Anointed One. David is the Anointed One of God, and Daniel was also the Anointed One of God. The rabbis maintain that the scriptures speak of the Lord God bringing his Anointed One to deliver Israel. And in both of these instances, David and Daniel functioned as a deliverer for God's people. The idea behind the story of Daniel that was to pray to any god besides to King Darius for 30 days, and this may have been an attempt to wipe out the Jewish people in exile in Babylon. And so when we read Daniel, one interpretation may be that it wasn't just directed to Daniel. It was directed to Israel in exile. And so Daniel was brought by God as Israel's deliverer. And the rabbis also believe that the, the Lord God has kept an anointed one for each generation and Presently, the Anointed One, the Messiah, is hidden. Now, in Jewish eschatology, the term Mashiach, Messiah, came to refer to a future Jewish king 
from the Davidic line, was expected to be anointed with holy anointing oil and rule the Jewish people during the Messianic age. And that's taken from the Jewish virtual library on the Messiah. Now in the Masoretic text, the Messiah is often referred to as the King Messiah, Melech HaMashiach. In an Aramaic, uh, in Aramaic, uh, it says Melech HaMashiach. In the Orthodox, in Orthodox Judaism, it views uh, the views have generally held that the Messiah will be descended from his father through the line of King David and will gather the Jews back into the land of Israel, usher in an era, area, an era of peace, build the third temple, father a male heir, and reinstitute the Sanhedrin, among other things. In addition, Jewish tradition alludes to two redeemers, both of whom are called Mashiach, and are involved in ushering in the Messianic age, and as everyone knows here, Mashiach ben David and Mashiach ben Yosef are those two messiahs. The Talmud discusses the coming of the Messiah in the Talmud Bavli Sanhedrin 98a and describes a period, of, a period of peace and freedom, which will be the time of ultimate goodness for the Jews and for all of mankind. The Tractic Sanhedrin contains a long discussion of the events leading to the coming of the Messiah. And I quoted from the Sanhedrin 98a on the page, bottom page 14, top page 15. That says that, our Johanan said, When you see a generation ever dwindling, hope for him, the Messiah, as it is written, an inflicted people thou wilt save. Our Johanan said, When thou seest a generation overwhelmed by many troubles as by a river, await him, as it is written, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him, which is followed by, and the Redeemer shall come to Zion. Ariochanan also said, The son of David will come only in a generation that is either altogether righteous or altogether wicked. In a generation that is altogether righteous, as it is written, thy people also shall be all righteous, they shall inherit the land forever, or altogether wicked, as it is written, he and he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. And it is also written, For mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. And so, the Talmudic story of the coming of the Messiah is coupled with the belief in the ability of one's actions to hasten his arrival. And as the rabbis say here in Sanhedrin 98a, that whether wicked or righteous, this hastens the, the arrival of the Messiah. The rabbis provide many stories about the Messiah, some of which represent famous Talmudic sages as, received, uh, as receiving personal visitations from Eliyahu from Elijah, the prophet, and the Messiah. And one example is taken from Sanhedrin 98a again, and that's as follows, and I quote that on page 15. Our Joshua, son of Levi, met Elijah standing by the entrance of Rabbi Simeon, son of Yochai's tomb. He asked him, Have I a portion in the world to come? He replied, If this master desires it, Rabbi Joshua, son of Levi, said, I saw two, but heard the voice of a third. He then asked him, When will the Messiah come? Go and ask him he your himself, was his reply. Where is he sitting? Sitting. At the entrance. And by what sign may I recognize him? He is still sitting among the poor lepers. All of them unite, all of them untie them all at once and rebandage them together. Whereas he unties and rebandages each separately before treating the next thinking should I be wanting or wanted it being time for my appearance as a messiah I must not be delayed through having to bandage a number of sores so he went to him and greeted him saying peace upon thee master and teacher peace upon thee son of Levi he replied when wilt thou come master he asked asked he and today was his answer on his returning to Elijah, the latter inquired, What did he say to thee? Peace be upon thee, O son of Levi, he answered. Whereupon he, Elijah, observed, He thereby assured thee and thy father of a portion of the world to come. He spoke falsely to me, he rejoined, stating that he would come today, but is not. He, Elijah, answered him, This is what he said to thee today, if you will listen to his voice. Okay. 
So the point is that, uh, and that was from Sanhedrin 98a, is that the Lord God provides for his people a deliverer, and according to the Midrash, the wicked are opposed to the Lord God in heaven in his ways, and hold such a strong opposition to God's ways that they would break into heaven if it was even possible. The Midrash states that the wicked, not being capable of breaking into heaven, they instead attack God's anointed one and his people. The Midrash then continues and says the following. At the bottom of page 15, The presidents and the satraps said to Darius, Are you not a king to do just such? All kings establish statutes and makes laws, as it is said according to the law of the Medes and the Persians. But in your lifetime, you have not established any statute. The king, hearing them say, Now, O king, establish the interdict and sign the writing, gave in to them, and King Darius signed the writing and the interdict. And when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, his windows being opened in his chamber towards Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed, saying, Hear my voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from the terror of, my enemy, of the enemy. And when they sought out Daniel, they found him as he stood praying, as it is said, Then these men came tumultuously and found Daniel praying and making supplica supplication before his God. Daniel chapter 6 verse 12 Whereupon Daniel uttered the following words before God, These men come tumultuously upon me. Hide me from the counsel of the evildoers, from the tumult of the workers of iniquity. And that was from Midrash to Helim uh, 64 part 1. The rabbis recount the story of King Darius establishing a law forcing everyone in his kingdom to worship the image uh, that he built. And Daniel maintained praying to the Lord God in heaven rather than to Darius's image. The men inspired the king to establish this law and then laid in wait for Daniel to disobey the law and sought to have him killed. And Midrash states that Daniel prayed and making supplication before his God Whereupon Daniel uttered the following words before God, These men come tumultuously upon me. Hide me from the counsel of the evildoers from the tumult of the workers of iniquity. So the rabbis are saying that David prophetically recorded the words that Daniel would say at a future time. And Daniel's understood as being anointed of God. Anointed in the plural, and where it says the anointed ones, where it means the anointed ones in the Midrash, may refer to the patriarchs. and However, the patriarchs were never anointed with oil, and like priests, prophets, and kings in later times. And David speaks of the anointed ones, plural, according to Psalm 105. And so on. Um, and what, what's happening is that in the Midrash, if you look at Midrash to Helim 64, part 1, the rabbis use the uh, this word Hamashiim and so they use the plural for Hamashiach for anointed ones and the idea is that it, it may refer to the patriarchs but they weren't anointed with oil and so just like the prophets, priests and kings were at later times and then so I found a, a scripture here from the Psalms where David uses the uh, the, in the plural form of the anointed ones and it's all Psalm 105 verses 6 through 15 and that says O seed of Abraham his servant O sons of Jacob his chosen ones he is the Lord our God his judgments are in all the earth he has remembered his covenant forever the word which he commanded to a thousand generations the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac then he confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will make the land of Canaan as a portion of your inheritance. And when they were only a few men in number, very few and strangers in it, and they wandered about from nation to nation, from kingdom, from one kingdom to another people, and he permitted no man to oppress them, and he reproved kings for their sakes. Do not touch my anointed ones, and do my prophets no harm. Okay. And okay, and so here the term bim shichei is uh, written as my anointed ones, and it's refer uh, is a reference to the Lord's prophets. And note that the anointed ones are also applied to 
the covenant people as a whole according to Psalm 89 verse 38 and then 89 verse 51. And in the Midrash it continues and it says the following, it says, as soon as the presidents and the satraps found the means, they approached the king. As I said, then they came near and spoke before the king considering concerning the king's interdict. Have you not signed the interdict that every man that will make petition unto any god or man within thirty days, save you, O king, will be cast into the lion's den? And the king answered and said, This is true, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which is not altered. Then they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, who is of the children of the captivity of Judah, does not regard you, O king, nor the interdict that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased, and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to, to rescue him. And as the, prophets, or as the presidents and the satraps reproached the king, he said, Look you, you are not to be delivered. And so they kept quiet the whole day. Oh, sorry. Look you, you are not to be believed. And so he, they kept quiet the whole day. And at the going down of the sun, Daniel began to pray, saying, Because of these wicked men should not a man pray. Hence it is said, The king labored till the going down of the sun to rescue him. Surely, if David did what he did for the sake of a prayer, which a man may omit without fear of being cut down by heathen or being cut down, cut to death by a court, how much more ought we to heed other obligations for, the, for whose neglect we are liable to be cut down by heaven to save Daniel? He could not do so, for, for the presidents and the satraps said to him, You have told us you are not to be believed. Behold, you have seen for yourself. Okay, so and that's from Midrash Shalim 64, Part 1. So it seems like the rabbis, and I don't know, I can't remember if I wrote about this, but I just thought, thought that the rabbis talk about uh, at the end here that of what I had just read, written, or re, um, what I read, was that Daniel could have just not prayed for 30 days, you know, and um, by just, you know, because just so that he wouldn't disobey the king's edict, right, and die. And if he would have just not prayed for 30 days, he wouldn't have been cut down. Whereas, I guess the fear should be more from he who is above, right? The fear of God. Because by not praying for 30 days, then you could be cut down from heaven. you know. And so, I thought that was interesting. I, didn't, I don't know if I noticed that before. But the concept that's put forward here in the Midrash is that Daniel feared the Lord God in heaven more than the courts of men in their legal ruling. Daniel realized that compromising with temporal powers can never lead to redemption. Generally speaking, compromise leads to falling away from God's meets vote. For example, most believers today has, have accepted the unrighteous code of lawmakers instead of insisting that lawmakers follow God's morality as is described in the Torah. Can anyone think of what that might be today? Huh? No homosexuality, right? And the kingdoms of this world use force, for there is no love in what they do, whereas the kingdom of God uses the Torah, and love is the keeping of the Torah, the keeping of the commands. There is a big difference between these two types of actions. The Apostle James said that there is only one lawgiver in James chapter 4, verse 12, who is the Lord. And according to the scriptures, governments have historically led people to sin. And we see this throughout the scriptures here. I, I list Daniel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, Isaiah. It's just examples of historically how governments have led people to sin. And that is happening today, you know, in the United States and all over the world. And according to just as you know what we're finding here in Daniel chapter seven, and according to the prophets in first Samuel chapter eight, the Lord condemned Israel for wanting to be ruled like the other nations by a human king. And when they chose to be ruled by a human leader, our Father in heaven considered that decision to be a rejection of himself. The reason being that the people were choosing someone else to reign over them rather rather than God. And only later did the people realize their sin 
against the Lord when the man who was elected to govern them turned out to be unfaithful and disobedient to God's command. The major thrust of the prophets was not in the creation of new laws, but in the return in the observance of God's Torah. And, since, and such is the case with Hezekiah and Josiah, and it was a return to the ways of the Lord was made among them. God was pleased with their directing and requiring the judges and officers to act according to the Torah. In addition to this, um, in addition, this is the thrust of the apostolic writings, I believe, and the new covenant that the Lord has made, and as we read in Jeremiah 31, in the Messiah by writing his Torah on our hearts. Now, the scriptures, in addition to this, tell us that to serve an earthly king or his government is to serve other gods. We find that in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And this may have been the result of the nations who believe their rulers to be gods, or, or the son of the gods, like we find in uh, in Rome, Greece, we find in Egypt, you know, all these neighboring countries. The scriptures describe following disobedient governments as a form of disobedience, and the Lord rejected those who followed the statutes of governments instead of His commandments. And the reason being, throughout the history of Israel, the majority of the kings of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, showing us that. The ruler who does not trust in God results in governments that are corrupt. In, in the apostolic writings, the Jewish leaders, in similar historical fashion, chose King Caesar over King Messiah Yeshua in John chapter 19, verse 15. And based upon the covenant agreement that we have in Yeshua and all, on all of Scripture, the duty of man is to live by God's commandments and not by man's commandments which turn from the truth, from God's truth. The Apostle Paul said that the servant of the Messiah is to keep God's Torah in Romans 13, verse 8. And when we pray, we pray to do our Father's will, not man's will. And I'm giving scripture references here in the study, and it's a good idea to go and look at these. I won't read all of them, but um, examples for that following the Father's will, not man's will, Matthew 6.10, and Luke chapter 11, verse 2. The Lord revo rewards those who place His laws above man's laws, and we are even instructed to avoid going to courts of law before the unjust and unbelievers, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, mostly for the reason of the corruption in the courts. And David, he expounded upon these things according to his psalm, saying, like in the, in the very first psalm, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, in Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. The kings and the rulers of the earth are against the Lord and against his anointed, as David says in Psalm 2, where the wicked frame mischief and sin in their hearts. Now, in Psalm 94, verse 20, it says, Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frame mischief by a law? In Isaiah 10, verse 1 to 2, Woe unto them that prescribe grievous laws and take away the right from the poor. And so when a government is ungodly and the people trust in that government, the Lord God will punish those whose trust is not in the Lord. And there's plenty of scripture references for that. The people will be cursed for trusting in man. And it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man in governments. And this is the whole point of the Midrash on Daniel who feared the Lord God in heaven more than the courts of, or the, you know, the Midrash on David, I guess, who feared the Lord God in heaven more than the courts of men and their legal ruling. And, you know, Daniel was, was similar. He, he didn't fear men, he feared God. He didn't fear King Darius, he feared the Lord in heaven. And so the Midrash then, it continues, and it says the following. It says, then as scripture says, the king commanded, and they brought Daniel out and cast him into the den of lions. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den. But whence are there stones in Babylon? This stone flew from the land of Israel and came to rest at the mouth of the den. Rabbi Huna, in the name of Rabbi Josi, interpreted the word stone as meaning that an angel in the likeness of a lion came and sat at the mouth of the den. In the proof, the verse, My God has sent his angel, and has shut the lion's mouth, 
and they have not hurt me. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were divisions brought before him. No, I'm sorry, diversions brought, brought before him, and his sleep fled from him. For he said, what did, this aff- what did this affliction that I should be cause of this man's dying see in me that made it come? Then the king arose early, very early in the morning and went in haste into the dyans, unto the di- lion's den. And when he came near unto the den to Daniel, he cried with a pained voice, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is your God whom you serve continually able to deliver you from the lions? And though Daniel heard, he did not answer because he was reading the Shema. Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the the lion's mouths. How did this happen? When Daniel went down to the lions, they, came, they became like tame beasts in his presence, as is said. The lion, which is mighty and turns not away from me, became a tame beast. For the Holy One, blessed be he, said, Let a lion come and deliver a lion from the mouth of a lion. Then was the king exceedingly glad and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. And the king commanded that they brought those men who accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions. For the accusers have said to the king, Because the lions were already satiated, they did not devour Daniel. The king said to them, If the lions are satiated, satiated, go down and lodge with them this night. Then we will see whether they are satiated. When the accusers were cast into the den, they were at once devoured, as I said. But God will, will shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they will be smitten. And as scripture says, And they cast them into the den of lions them, their children, and their wives, Daniel 6, verse 25. And uh, you remember from the Torah portion from, was it last week, where when that one man sinned by taking something, his entire family died? Look at this, that uh, it seems that these satraps and these prefects that come against Daniel, not only did they die, their children and their wives died too. You know, and so it was in the interest of their children and their wives to keep their on dad and their husbands on the straight and narrow. I mean, you know, one would think. <laughs> but um, that, that's fascinating. I didn't notice that before. But, um, yeah, that, that's really fascinating. But um, the Midrash, it looks at the scriptures that speak of Daniel being cast in the den of lions and a stone being placed over the mouth of the den. And what's really fascinating about this is the question that's asked in the Midrash is, where are there stones in Babylon? And the answer is that this stone flew from the land of Israel and came to rest at the mouth of the den. And that seems odd, doesn't it? And I, if you remember from, oh man, a year or more ago, we're studying the Psalms that we found in the, in the Talmud a story of a spiritual rock that followed Israel around and gave them water in the wilderness. And then how Paul used a spiritual rock analogy to refer to Yeshua in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And, um, you know, really, really good study. If you search to Matsadi.com, you'll probably be able to find it. But, or search Google with Matsadi.com with those those words, you'll probably be able to find it. But um, here, the rabbis, they say that you know, Daniel is put in this lion den, and then where are there stones in Babylon that this stone flew from the land of Israel and came to rest at the mountain at the mouth of the den? Why do you do the rabbis ask the question on a stone, and why do they say this stone flew from Israel? What do you think about that? Why do you think they refer to a stone flying? Anyone have any thoughts on that? And could this be, and I thought, this is what come to my mind, you know, could this be, and you know, it could be connected to that spiritual rock that I just mentioned as well, that Paul drew upon in his letter to the Corinthians, but could this be a reference to the Lord being our rock, as we read in Parashat Ha'azinu, the last portion in Deuteronomy, the stones that save are the Lord God being in the land of Israel, you know, and the the the, the point is is that being in the land of Israel is connected to the stone, our rock, our redeemer, you know, to the, to God, to being in the covenant, you know, to receiving the rewards of the covenant, 
the blessings of the covenant, you know. And so uh, we, we get this, this kind of image that's coming into this rock imagery that, that we find in the Torah portion and hear what the rabbis are trying to say. And the stones that, that flew from Israel brings up these images of the Lord who is our Redeemer, our Savior, our rock, you know, the Lord God Almighty. And in the Talmud Bavli, Barachot 30, it says the following concerning stones. And I quote on page 8, page, let's see, page 19, top of page 19, it says that it is written, and he took from the stones of the place, and again it is written, and he took the stone. Rabbi Isaac said, says, this teaches us that all these stones gathered themselves together into one place, as if each were eager that the saint should lay his head upon it. And it happened as the rabbis tell us that all the stones were swallowed up by one another and thus emerged one big stone. Okay. Well, here the rabbis are citing from Genesis 28 verse 18 and Jacob who was uh, going to Pedan Aram, remember? And he was fleeing from his brother Esau. And so the rabbis speak of stones miraculously coming together for Jacob and so that they would be under his head and um, that Jacob would sleep on it, you know, that the saint would lay his head on it. And then Jacob took these stones and he arranged them into a pillar and then anointed them with oil. And then God had reaffirmed the covenant, right? And Jacob had said that if, if um, you know, you will keep me, you'll bring me back to this place and you will be my God. Remember that? And so... It's really neat how all these these this picture of the of the covenant and the stones and, and the sa- our savior and the, and our our father in heaven are 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 coming together here with regard to the stones and the rabbis taught that the stones moved together into one place, being eager that the righteous man would lay his head on it, and so my thought was could it be in the midrashic interpretation here on the stone that covered the lion's dead den having flown from Israel be taking, taken within this concept and the, the and within this context, context that the stone moving so Daniel the righteous man may lay his head upon the rock and another thing would be that if God you know I guess the idea would be that when the people were exiled that the Lord remained in Israel and that the Lord came all the way you know as if he is representative of the stone. He came all the way and he sat at the mouth of the den, the Lord himself, to save Daniel. I think that is that is really neat. That is really, really kind of awesome if you think about that kind of imagery. And when we think on stones moving, we're reminded of Yeshua's words in the apostolic writings in Mark cha- or in Matthew chapter 17 and Mark chapter 11. So I quote from these two sections of verses. Um... Actually, there are three here. Mar- Matthew 17, 19 to 21. Then the disciples came to Yeshua privately and said, Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, Because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And in Matthew 21, verse 20 to 22, seeing this, the disciples were amazed and asked, How did the fig tree wither all at once? And Yeshua answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will say, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and cast in the sea, it will happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. And then Mark 11. 22:26 and, Ye- and Yeshua answered saying to them have faith in God truly I say to you whoever says of this mountain be taken up and cast in sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that what he says is going to happen it will be granted him therefore I say to you all things from which you pray and ask believe that you have received them and they will be granted you whenever you, whenever you stand praying forgive 
If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. Okay, so we look at these things. These the, what Yeshua is talking about this mountain, mountain being composed of all these stones, and we're we're talking about prayer, you know. And we we talk about the we look at the rock. The Lord being our rock. We look at Israel, the Israel being the place of the covenant. You know, when we are standing before a holy God, we are standing within the covenant. We are walking in His ways. He is our foundation. What we ask in the name of Yeshua, He will hear us, and our prayers will be answered. Right, and so we're finding all of this within the context here with of the stones, in. Yeshua speaks of having faith in moving mountains. The Midrash speaks of the stone that flew from Israel to cover the mouth of the lion's den. And to me, it seems that when Daniel was praying, that this mountain moved from Israel to Babylon to save him. You know, And at least that's the, the picture that I get when thinking about that. But it, it's, this movement of the stone is miraculous, and, occur, and it occurs by the power of God. And it was by the power of God that Daniel survived the situation. And, you know, if we consider sin in our lives, or if you have sin in your life that just appears to be a mountain that you just can't overcome, the Lord can overcome it for you, you know. And we can cast that away from us, you know, by, by the power of the Spirit in the name of Yeshua, you know. And... um these these are the kind of things that that seem to come to mind when I'm when we were studying these this midrash here tonight, but the midrash then it goes on saying that Rabbi Huna, in the name of Rabbi Josi, interpreted the word stone as meaning meaning that an angel in the likeness of a lion came and sat at the mouth of the den, and the proof was the verse My God has sent His angel and has shut the Lord the lion's mouths, and they have not hurt me Daniel six twenty three. They are indeed thinking of the miraculous work of the Lord to deliver Daniel. And the Midrash recounts the king's anguish over Daniel. And then the next morning he comes and asks Daniel if the living God had saved him from the lion's mouths. And the Midrash states that David heard the king, but he did not reply because he was reading the Shema. And, you know, the first thing, it says that he was reading the Shema. Was it given a Torah scroll, or did he take a Torah scroll with him? You know, yeah, I could think of that. That if if you're going to Lions Den, and you have your Bible in hand, I'm going to say I'm going to go to my death with the Word of God in my hand. That that's what I I would do. You know, I wouldn't leave it be. It would be right here next to my chest because it's God's Word, and it very may well be that's what happened, or at least that's the rabbinic imagery that that's going into the in the midrash here. But Daniel was reading from the Shema from Deuteronomy and he may have had a Torah scroll, you know, whether he did or not, but um, this again may be a reference to the heathen who rage against the Lord and against his Torah, against his ways, and against his anointed one. And um Rocky says they tied him up and he couldn't carry anything. Did they tie him up? I can't remember if they tied him up or not. Maybe, you know, maybe. And Keturah says, I read in Donin today that we we are required to read the Shema twice a day, morning and night. Yeah, yeah. And so um, that might have been the morning Shema, you know. And so Daniel then, uh, he answers the king and says, The Lord has sent his angel to close the mouth of the lions. And the men who accused Daniel were then brought out and cast into the den, and they were consumed immediately. And then the conclusion of the Midrash, it says that how many were cast into the den of lions. Mark what the scripture says. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom a hundred and twenty satraps, and over them three presidents of whom Daniel was one. In that's in Daniel chapter 6, verses 2 to 3. Thus there was one hundred and twenty-two men and their children and their wives, making three hundred four lions who tore each one into four pieces, one piece for each beast, the beast tearing them apart, even before they got down to the bottom of the den, as it is said that they had not come to the bottom of the den. There were, there were 1,464 lions. Hence it is said that 
He that is righteous will be glad in the Lord and will take refuge in him and all the upright in heart in heart will glory. And so the scriptures say Darius set 120 satraps over the provinces and appointed three men over these satraps, one of, them, one of whom was Daniel. Notice how the rabbis add two. They say 122 men, 122 wives, 122 children. So why do the rabbis add two more men, two more wives, and two more children? Anyone have any ideas on that? Throughout the Psalms, we find David expressing his total commitment and reliance in the Lord. And generations later, David's descendant, Daniel, embodies this same character despite his power to interpret dreams and the authority that was given to him by Darius and then the challenges that he faced each day trying to live a Torah observant life in the midst of Babylon. Remember he said he didn't they didn't want to eat from the king's table. They wanted to have a kosher diet, you know. So they will eat only vegetables, you know. And uh, just so they wouldn't eat the pork. Daniel had been given all of these things and yet he did not become arrogant. He remained humble before the Lord. He was praying three times a day. In addition, the addition of two more may be a midrashic understanding of this psalm as prophetically referring to Daniel's story and Darius the need taking over rule and appointing 120 satraps to govern his country. These men were greedy and corrupt. Daniel appointed as the head of them all along with two others. And so some of these 120 satraps got up together and tried to take Daniel down as they were jealous of him Daniel was a righteous man who prayed three times daily. These men pressed Darius to, to decree that it was, it was prohibited for one to pray to another other than Darius for the first 30 days of his reign. The satraps succeeded in having the king to make this decree into law that any prayers recited not directly to the king would be punished by execution by being thrown into the lion's pit. Daniel refused to stop praying to the living God and was caught in addition, that this decree may have been a form of idolatry or individual persecu persecution against Judaism in Babylon. Uh, that, was, that was a thought. And in Psalm 64, verses 6 through 8, it says that they despised injustices, saying, We are ready with a well-conceived plot, for the inward thought and the heart of a man are deep, but God will shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they will be wound wounded, so they will make him stumble. Their own tongue is against them. All who seek them will shake the head. So ungodly men will stumble by their own words and actions because the Lord God is shooting them with arrows due to their sin and their wickedness. When the satraps saw that Daniel was untouched by the lions, they may have, been argued, they may have argued to the king that Daniel was not touched by the lions because they were not hungry. And the king threw them into the den, and the scriptures say that they were devoured immediately. He ordered that they all be thrown into the den to test if the lions were indeed hungry. And the Midrash asks how many were cast into the den, and the rabbis refer to 120 satraps being cast into the den. The wicked stumble and fall into their own trap and died, and that's exactly what had happened to uh, what they were planning on Daniel. That's what happened to them. When the people witnessed the great miracle of Daniel's salvation and the downfall of his conspirators, they were brought to awe before the Lord, whom Daniel credited with his salvation. King Darius then sent out a decree publicizing the miracle and giving credit to the great God of Daniel who, saw, who saved him. And he acknowledged the Lord as a living God, eternal and all-powerful. And when we experience the miracles and the kindness of the Lord in our own lives, we strive to share it with others and pass on the faith that we have and to encourage others in the same. Daniel followed in the footsteps of his great predecessor, King David, who used the Psalms as a powerful tool for showing the mercies of God and singing praises to his name. And we should do the same. Now, so that concludes the Psalm study on the Midrash. And let me close with prayer and then uh, I'll open the mic. Heavenly Father, you are a blessing to us always in the way in which you work to strengthen our faith in giving us a willing spirit within to live obediently to your words. 
We thank you for revealing your truth and righteousness to us. We thank you for David's words, which bring out these important discussion points. We thank you, Lord, for the rabbi's words that also help us to look more closely, more carefully at the scriptures. We thank you for giving us the faith to believe in Yeshua, the King, Messiah. And we praise your holy name. And please, Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us for our sins. Help us to live righteous lives and to set our minds on those things that bring glory to your name. We thank you, Lord, for sending your Son, Yeshua, that we may enter into the covenant of peace that you have promised to your people. Help us to grow in the faith, to walk in the Spirit, and to apply these truths to our lives. And we praise your holy name. We give you all the honor and the glory and the praise forever and ever. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.